Hi, everyone. Um, by now, most of you have heard about virtual reality if you haven't actually already seen it yourself. So in doing that, uh, I wanted to go ahead and talk to you a little bit about it because it's what I do every day. I create virtual reality videos and films. So before I could talk to you about uh, all the amazing immersive experiences that virtual reality creates and all the ways that it's incredible and changes our ability to tell stories in the future, I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about what VR does to our past. In order to do that, I'm going to tell you a fairly unusual um, but true story. It's actually my story. I happen to be a particularly adventurous person. I'm that kind of person who always says yes when everybody else says no. I spend a lot of time doing any new experience that crosses my path, even if it means forgoing things like sleep. So this is me uh, in New York. And when I left college here, actually at State, I decided to move to what I thought was, at that time, the most exciting city with the most opportunities to do every possible thing that I could do. And I was right. I spent all of my 20s having an amazing time. So what that means is, at a certain point, when you are having crazy, new, fun experiences all day, every day, you hit sort of a plateau when the extraordinary becomes the norm. And you start to think to yourself, after many, many years of this, what's next? What am I going to do next? What's the next chapter in my life that's going to create some more interesting experiences? So I decided, after a lot of thinking, that I wanted to move to San Francisco, or in this case, back to San Francisco, um, and try some new experiences there. So as you can imagine, someone with an adventurous spirit, I am also afflicted by what we like to call FOMO, or a fear of missing out. <laughs> so upon getting ready to leave, I gave myself six to nine months. And I decided to make a list of all the things I hadn't done yet, all the random tourist attractions that I hadn't yet seen, because when you live somewhere, you don't actually bother to do that. Um, all the like gallery openings and parties and all the things that I just circumstantially hadn't done yet. And I also decided I really wanted to like, create a journal and keep all these things, catalog them, right? Uh, but I knew I didn't have time to actually write anything down because I'm sleeping like three hours a night and doing lots of stuff. So I went out and I purchased a video camera. Um, at that point, we couldn't record everything on our phones, or we could, it was like two pixels. So um, I bought one of those little flip cameras. I don't know if any of you remember those. You might, you might not. Um, it's the, about the size of a cell phone made into like sort of a brick. And I recorded everything I was doing, every happy hour I went to with my friends, every concert that I went to, everything that I was doing. And then I started noticing that maybe after like a really short period of time, I started recording other things as well. I started recording the guy playing the violin in the subway. And I started recording what it felt like to look up during the first snow. And it's this beautiful, clean, quiet time in New York, which is extraordinary there. And I started collecting all of these moments of my every day and putting them into these videos, these little like kind of music videos with times with me and my friends hanging out and doing stuff, and these experiences that I was having. And I shared them with my friends on YouTube, and that was really fun. And it was this great catalog of my time there. And then the time came, and I you know, packed up a truck, and I was ready to go. I was going on to my next adventure. My best friend and I, we got into a car, or into that truck, and we were taking a cross-country road trip. And here's where the story actually takes the fairly unusual turn. We were staying over in a town called Lincoln, Nebraska. And by our general misfortune, we got attacked. I woke up in a hospital, and I had no idea where I was, how I'd gotten there. I had lost months of my life. My formal diagnosis was traumatic brain injury and retrograde amnesia. When I woke up, I had a five-second loop of a memory over and over and over again. 
I had gone to bed months earlier in New York and woke up with no idea how I'd gotten there. Eventually, over the course of recovery, I started to have a longer memory. Five seconds turned into 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and that part of my memory actually came back. But those times, those months that I lost were gone. I'd have the occasional flash of something cool that I did, some little piece, but it was gone. And I started to become really desperate for the first time for the things that weren't new to me, but things that I had done before. And I started obsessing over those videos. I started watching them over and over and over and over again. I started editing them and re-editing them and looking at all the raw footage. And I mean, like, I spent all of my time doing this to the point where it was basically the only thing I enjoyed. And then I also started obsessing about memory in general. I started learning as much as I could about it. Like maybe if I learned enough, if I got enough information, I could find tricks, I could find tips, I could make it better, I could get that time back. And it didn't necessarily work that way. But I did learn a lot. I learned that most of the time you keep your memories in this. This is the hippocampus. It's where you store a lot of stuff. It's like your memory file cabinet. But when they start doing brain scans of people while they're trying to remember certain things or give them cues to remember certain things, they found that it actually lights up all over your brain. So you don't just store your memories there. It's actually this space where you store things based on a sensory recall, which means that your memory isn't just based in this thing where you can be like, I need to remember this, and so I remember it. You remember it based on the things that trigger you to remember something. So a good example is if I am you know, walking by a red door, I think of that movie that I loved with, where they focused on the red door. And then I think of the date that I went on, where someone took me to that movie. And then pretty much immediately, I think of the feeling of them holding my hand. You use all of your senses to create memories, all of them. And there's a good reason for that. Anthropologically speaking, you want to know that when you smell smoke, that means fire. You want to understand that if you walk into a dark room and you smell something that reminds you of iron or something like that, that that might be blood and that you shouldn't go in there or that you should at least be of heightened awareness for it. Things like directions is a big part of why you would remember something, why we tell stories even, which means you'll also remember that if you are trying to learn directions, you will remember it better if you go there yourself versus if you just look at a map or if someone tells you how to get there. And the reason is you're picking up all the sensory input that someone gives you when you go to that space. You remember that there was a weird guy with the little sign on the corner that day that you went to that location instead of just looking at the street to turn on this street because this sign said to do so. so in doing that, I'm going to bring us back to VR a little bit because thinking about maps is actually a really good allusion to those of you who haven't actually seen VR for yourselves. So this is Google Earth. I'm assuming most of you have used it before. So if you've never used VR, it's as if somebody took a giant dome or ball and put you into like a human-sized hamster ball. And on the inside of that hamster ball, they put Google Earth. They put the like, image around. So whenever you look up, you look up. When you look to the side, you see what's to the side of you. When you look behind you, same thing. Now I want you to picture that when you're inside of that big, giant, personal hamster ball, that it's not just a two-dimensional image like this, that it's three-dimensional. So when you see that pole, you're right next to that pole. And you remember almost running into it. And that it's moving. And when you move, you move with it. And a car moves by you, the car actually moved by you. So when you're in virtual reality, you're not just looking at it as a story that somebody is telling you. You're looking at it as a memory that you're having. And when you think about it, that's what you think about the story you just saw. You think about yourself in that story as the person experiencing it. This can be really jarring sometimes. So if you're at the edge of a cliff, that can be a really exciting thing, or it could be a really, really scary thing. And so as a filmmaker, you kind of have to be really aware that if you want to throw somebody into that setting, that's great. And if you don't, you have to be aware they're going to have that effect. The first time I ever saw virtual reality, 
I was meeting up in a coffee shop because after that incident in Nebraska, I obsessed so much about video that I started doing it for a living, full time, all the time, every day. And it's awesome. Um, but the first time I ever saw it, I was in a coffee shop and I was meeting up with the CEO of a VR camera company. And he says, have you ever seen virt virtual reality before? To which I go, well, I've heard about it, but not really, no. I mean, I saw Lawnmower Man in like 92, but whatever. <laughs> um, and he puts this bulky brick of a headset on me. And it's awkward, and I'm like, okay. And he shows me this video. And in the video, there is a really plain room, and a woman is standing there or sitting there, and there's like a baby right in front of me. It's a very unassuming scene. And the baby starts moving towards me. And it reaches out to me, and I just instinctively reach back. And all I thought in that moment was, God, I would give anything to have had that when I was filming those months. I would give anything to be able to have that time back again. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works for me. But it is the way it works for everybody moving forward. So VR is an amazing, awesome experience, and isn't it great to skydive? And isn't it great to climb Everest? And it is, it's really cool. But also, isn't it great to be in the room with your parent that died 10 years ago and be able to sit across the table from them again? And that's the reason VR is important. So I could show you, because we're gonna do a demo, I could show you an experience that would like knock your socks off, but what I am going to show you is the one that isn't something I watch once or twice because it's fun or cool. I'm going to show you my kayaking trip that I was taken on for my birthday, because this is the one I actually watch over and over again. This is the one that means something to me. So go ahead and take out your phones. You guys were instructed to download the video and put them in your uh, headset. So this is, well, a 2D version, not quite as much fun as actually watching it. <laughs> well, I'm glad you guys can be there with me that day. It was really great. So moving forward into the future a little bit. Virtual reality is fairly new, but it's growing exponentially every single day. They're already starting to work on things like haptic suits. Uh, this is sort of an invention that creates a nerve stimulation, um, et cetera. So if you are climbing Everest or have an experience where you're doing that, it will make you feel cold. Or if you are jumping out of an airplane, it will make the wind go past you. It creates the story with all of your senses, or as many as can, can happen right now. We keep moving forward, and the, the thing about virtual reality is that it doesn't just lock you into your past or into all the cool tech stuff that we can do in the future, but it really helps you connect to other people's experiences, to what they were doing, and honestly, for me at least, to myself. Thank you.